Thanks for coming today. Um, before I formally introduce Paolo, I just want to again give a uh, shout out and thank you to Care One Assisted Living and Memory Care and Sharon who provided today's refreshments. They're very seasonal. Um, and now I'll turn it over to Paolo who's here for a very timely <laughs> discussion on the American labor movement um, with everything that's going on in the auto industry. I'll turn it over to Paolo, thank, thank you. you. How's everybody doing today? Excellent. Can you hear me okay? Do I need to move the mic closer or is this, this okay? I can do this too. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll try to lean into it a little bit, I guess. So today we are diving into a, an exploration of the American labor movement, um, the birth of, of unions, re the reason why unions came to be, and kind of the impact that they have on shaping American society. Now, I've called the talk The Last Noble Protest. I'll explain that in a minute. But we're going to be looking specifically at the labor movement during the Industrial Age. Now, what does that term mean? What is the Industrial Age? For the purposes of this discussion, we're really going to be focusing on the decades after the Civil War. So from about 1865 to about 1810, 1815, uh, excuse me, 1910, 1915, we're going backwards. Uh, we're looking at that, that time period because that is really the, um, the heart of the second industrial revolution in the United States. And it's really when we begin to see nationwide unions emerging across the country. Now, that doesn't mean that there weren't labor movements here in this country prior to the Civil War. Uh, American industrialization starts right at the end of the 18th century. Some guy named Samuel Slater builds a mill down in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, and that jump, jump starts this entire uh, textile industry in the country. And places here in eastern Massachusetts, um, like um, Arlington and um, Lowell eventually become centers of the textile industry. So you have factories springing up, you have industrialization taking place, and you do have on a small scale labor movements taking place. Workers locally centered protesting against their working conditions and against their salaries and that sort of thing. The reason why this time period, that industrial age, the period after the Civil War is important is because we really see a transformation in American society during this time. All of a sudden, more people are living in cities than are living in the country. More people are working in factories than are working on the farms. So you have this shift of balance. You have this important uh, transformation occurring in American industry, in American working life, and in American society itself. So this is really the key period for the story of the labor movement in the United States. Now, the title itself, The Last Noble Protest, actually is a, a, comes from a quotation by this man, Wendell Phillips. Anybody know Wendell Phillips? He was a prominent social reformer in the 19th century, an abolitionist and a supporter of workers' rights in the labor movement at that time. And he says, the labor movement means just this. It is the last noble protest of the American people against the power of incorporated wealth. Um, he's kind of setting up a struggle between the, the wealthy industrialists and the working class, the laborers. And that really does define the story of industrialization, the story of the labor movement here in the United States. So let's dive into the story of that last noble protest and the emergence of American industry. Now, as I mentioned, much of this story takes place during what is sometimes referred to as the Second Industrial Revolution. This is that period after the Civil War, after the Union has been put back together, that American business, American industry, the American economy really begins to boom. This is the period where we see the rise of the robber barons, uh, people like your Rockefellers and your Carnegies and your J.P. Morgans and your Hills and the Vanderbilts, um, you know, those guys building their weekend houses down in Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, that was this time period. You have massive fortunes being amassed by, by these uh, wealthy industrialists and these wealthy families. And what we see here are some scenes from this period of industrialization, from the second industrial revolution. Workers on the factory floors, the, uh, the forest of smokestacks outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, that looks like a lovely place to spend a weekend, doesn't it? Um, the railroad, the trains. Of course, the railroads were really the, uh, 
the prime mover in industry in the United States, even before the Civil War. The railroads were the, the uh, bedrock of the American economy in a lot of ways because the railroad industry was a growth industry. We were laying thousands and thousands and thousands of miles of track, of track crisscrossing the continent, crisscrossing the United States. The railroads themselves were hugely important for the success of the American economy. What did the railroads do? Well, they carried people from place to place. They carried goods from place to place. They created national markets for products that were produced here in New England or in Pennsylvania or in Detroit. We have the movement of goods, the movement of commodities, the movement of people all across the United States. So the railroads were really one of those hugely significant industries that were continuously growing, continuously employing more and more people. Um, a lot of the story of the labor movement takes place in the railroad industry, and we'll get to that in a couple of minutes. Uh, and you see industrial cities springing up across the United States. Lowell, here in Massachusetts, is an early example of an industrial community. It was a planned, uh, a planned city um, that was centered around the textile factories that were built there along the Merrimack River. Other towns like that begin to spring up in other places, Lawrence, Massachusetts. As we push further west into other parts of the United States, we have all sorts of mill towns that, that develop. Into the old Confederacy, the old South, there are mills, textile mills, and other sorts of mills that are developed, and towns and communities spring up around those. So during this industrial age, the factories become the hubs of population growth. They become the centers of the establishment of communities across the United States. Um, and as long as the industry was flourishing, those communities generally did well. What's the flip side of that, however? The industry starts to decline. What happens to those communities? They start to fall apart. They do start to decline. We certainly see modern legacies of that in the, the United States today. You can look at places like Gary, Indiana which was built on the steel industry. When the steel industry left, what happens to Gary? You have mass depopulation, you have rampant crime, you have abandoned buildings all over the place. So it really is a, a part, a legacy of this period of industrialization. Now in this industrial revolution, in this booming economy that we establish across the United States with factories and railroads being built all over the place, who was benefiting the most? Who was making the most profit out of all of this? The rich. And in fact, the rich, it's kind of a same old story, I guess. Um, the rich benefited because they were the ones who controlled these industries, who controlled the monopolies. There, most of the corporations or many of the corporations that were becoming powerful, that were acquiring wealth during this time period, were monopolies. They controlled all aspects of an industry. They crushed ruthlessly any competition that dare to cut him to cut into their bottom line. Monopolies were tremendously powerful, tremendously influential. Because the monopolies were often controlled by one person or a couple of people or a family, those monopolists, those industrialists had tremendous power, not only because of their wealth, but because of their political influence. And what we begin to see is that um, money begins to seep into politics, leading to uh, perhaps politicians and congressmen and state senators and uh, mayors and governors not making the best decisions for the people, but fostering the, the, the uh, good things for the companies, for the industrialists, for the monopolies. Um, things haven't changed all that much in, in some regards. In any case, what we see here on the cartoon are a series uh, on the screen are a series of political cartoons from the time period, uh, depicting the power that the monopolies had. This upper image shows John D. Rockefeller. Now, what is Rockefeller best known for? Oil. His oil company, Standard Oil Company, at the height of its power at the end of the 19th century, controlled about 80% of glo global oil production. Now, think about that for a second. 80% of global oil production. Rockefeller had tremendous, tremendous wealth, and he used that wealth to influence politics. Now, what that cartoon over there in particular shows is Rockefeller looking at a tiny little White House held in his hand. Of course, who lives in the White House? The president. He is casting his eyes on the White House, on the presidency. And behind him, stretching off to the Capitol building there in the background, you notice all of those barrels of oil. That was Rockefeller's wealth. And if you look carefully at the Capitol building, you'll notice there are the smokestacks sticking out of it from the oil refineries. Essentially, what that cartoonist was saying was that um, Rockefeller's wealth has turned Congress into one of his oil refineries. 
He controls Congress. We see that same idea depicted in that lower uh, cartoon on the right. Uh, it might be tough to see, but that one's called The Bosses of the Senate. And what it shows is all the senators hard at work, and I'm going to put that in air quotes, hard at work at their desks in the Senate chamber in the Capitol building. And who is looming over them, uh, looking over their shoulders, but those bags of money that represented the industrial trust, the iron trust, the steel beam trust, the copper trust. It's essentially saying that the Senate was controlled by the monopolists, by the industrialists. Now, we do have to point out that at this point in our history, Senators were not elected by the people. We did not vote for senators. That doesn't begin to happen until 1916 with the passage of a constitutional amendment. At this time, at the end of the 19th century, who chose the senators that represented each state in the Senate? Nope. It was the state legislators. So the senators from Massachusetts were chosen by the legislators in Boston. They picked two people to represent them in the Senate. Uh, we do not get the direct vote on the Senate until after the ratification of the 16th Amendment, I think it is, that gives, uh, that makes the senators responsible to us rather than to the state legislators. So um, in that image, they're not even responsible to the legislatures of the states. They're, they're looking out for their money bags, their bosses, those industrial uh, interests. This other cartoon here at the bottom also is a critique of Standard Oil and John Rockefeller's company. It's called the Standard Oil Octopus. Uh, and what you see is this monstrous creature uh, capped by an oil, um, an oil container. It says Standard Oil on it. And those, the tentacles are reaching out to grab all different parts of uh, government, the machinery of government state houses, uh, state legislatures, the uh, Congress, and that last tentacle is reaching out to try to grab the White House. Standard Oil, Rockefeller wanted total control. He was using the mechanisms of his, his industry to try to acquire that control. Yet, despite this, or because of this, you had a tremendous amount of wealth and power concentrated in very, very few hands. Who was the one, who were the ones who were actually creating that wealth, however? Was Rockefeller out in the oil fields drilling for oil and refining the oil? Was Carnegie in the steel mill smelting the steel? No. The wealth, the power, the, the success of the industrialists rested very much on the backs of the working man, on the backs of American laborers. And what we see here on these cart three cartoons are um, critiques of the power of the monopolies, the power of the industrialists. This cartoon over here on the left is called Hopelessly Bound to the Stake. And what do we see but the working man, they are bound to the stake of monopoly, being burned uh, on this pyre. Now, if you look, each of those logs here on the fire has a face on it representing a politician who's actually breathing the fire that is burning the working man that is tied to the monopoly. So it's a critique of the power of monopoly and also the power of or the lack of response from Congress. That one in the middle um, has an echo of the Middle Ages to it. What you see in that cartoon, in the big image on that cartoon, are the the uh, the working men, the farmers, the the butchers, the blacksmiths, the uh, middle class bowing down at the feet of those industrialists and bringing those industrialists the bags of riches, uh, that which echoes. You can't really make it out in that smaller cartoon there in the center, but uh, which echoes what was happening in the Middle Ages when the peasants had to bring their goods to the lord of the manor and present them with gifts. It's saying we have history repeating itself here in the modern world in the nineteenth in nineteenth century. America. And finally, that last cartoon over there uh, is a visual representation of the burden of the workers. There you have the fat cats, the industrialists, the wealthy sitting high and dry on that raft above the tide. But whose backs do that, does that raft rest on? Who's supporting the raft above the water? The engineer, the butcher, the blacksmith, the worker holding up the raft that keeps the, the wealthy dry and afloat. So there really was this acknowledgement that uh, in, some, in some sectors that the wealth, the power of the industrialists, of the monopolies, was based on the labor of the working classes. Yet the working classes were largely cut out from that wealth, from that privilege, from that, um, from that luxury. And part of the reason for that was because 
control rested in the hands of the bosses, of the industrialists, of the, uh, the capitalists, if we want to use that term. The working class had very little power, had very little say in what was happening uh, in the in terms of the, the functioning of the economy. Now, who were the working classes in the United States? Um, there was a wide spectrum of the working classes. These were the people that worked in those industries, that worked for an hourly salary or a weekly salary. Um, they were men, women, children, toiling in the factories and in the mines and in the rail yards and the steel mills across the United States. Here we have a cross section of some of those industrial workers um, in, involved in various occupations. Um, one of the groups that was particularly uh, exploited were children. Now, why were children um, considered viable laborers? Oh, lost my picture. Why did the industrialists like to hire children? For a couple of reasons. There were a lot of them. They're little, they can fit into tight spaces, and you don't have to pay them a lot. You don't have to pay them a lot. Because a child is not a full-grown adult, they're not going to do as much work, you could pay them pennies on the dollar. And still, um, you know, there are plenty of children around that you could pay to do a lot of different work, a lot of different jobs. And what happens if, let's say, a six-year-old working in a steel mill gets crushed by a piece of machinery? Well, they're easily replaceable. There's plenty of other six-year-olds around, right? Uh, so there was that concept that the labor of child laborers wasn't worth a lot of money because, one, they have no skills. Two, they're little. Uh, they could fit into tight places. Um, I actually have to go back to the previous image to show you that those guys over there on the bottom right uh, working in a textile mill. They don't take up a lot of space. They're there in bare feet. They can get in close to the spindles and close to the moving parts of the machine. But also notice... There's that giant belt that's running around that's powering those machines. Nothing separating the worker from that belt. Say you get dizzy and you kind of lose your balance and you reach out, you get sucked up into that belt, your arm gets ripped off if you don't get killed. Um, and it was a very, very dangerous situation for uh, labor, laborers in general, but particularly for children. And here we see children working in a variety of industries. This group down here were breaker boys who worked in the coal mines of Pennsylvania and West Virginia and, and the Appalachians. What did breaker boys do? Well, as the name implied, they took bigger pieces of coal and broke it down into smaller pieces of coal. Um, a, an important part of the job, but they were eight, nine, ten years old working in the, coal, in the coal mines. And mining, by its very nature, is a dangerous occupation. Um, they were probably breathing in tons of coal dust, which of course has health complications. It was not a healthy, safe thing for children to do. We see up here in that upper left image, ch children working uh, as oyster shuckers. Anybody ever shucked an oyster? Well, you got to use a, one, a really sharp knife to pry the oyster open. Um, there were children as young as four years old working in this industry in places like uh, Seattle. Um, so it was not uncommon for child laborers to be working in that sort of industry. And then we have uh, textile workers and garment workers over there on the, uh, the upper right. So ch children were exploited in this industrial system because of their... Uh, expendability because of their cheapness. Now, another um, segment of the working class that also was paid less were, well, immigrants certainly, but we haven't gotten there yet, even women. Women were paid less than men. Again, some things don't change all that much. Why was that? Because women were considered to be less important, less significant, more expendable than men were. So women made less money working in these factories, in these mills. They, there, of course, health complications for women working in many of these industries. So we see that the industrialists, the corporations, were trying to uh, maximize their profit by exploiting the labor of the working classes, by not paying high salaries, by employing ch child laborers. Uh, here we see an anti-child labor cartoon. And by empl employing women who they could pay less. And eventually by employing large numbers of immigrants who were escaping poverty and war and starvation in their home country and coming to the United States and finding these jobs that were willing to pay them at all, um, we begin to see immigrants being exploited in these, these situations. Uh, this cartoon is, is powerful. 
Uh, what you see uh, is a slave ship with children tied to the oars. And um, the overseer there, marked Greed, on his, on his gown is holding the whip, driving these child laborers in the industrial, in the industrial sector. Now, with that said, what, um, what power did the workers have in relationship to the corporations? Let's say you were working in a textile mill in Lawrence, Massachusetts, and you're there working six days a week, 12 hour days, and you're making 25 cents an hour. Are you satisfied with that? You're sitting there and there's machines buzzing all around you and belts whipping by and it's a dangerous, unhealthy situation. Are you satisfied with that? Could you ask for a raise? Uh, you could, but what would probably happen to you? You'd lose your job. And what security would you have if you lose your job? What would happen to you? You would have no job. Uh, you, would, you would be out of work. Now, what happens if you're in this textile mill and you get injured on the job? Let's say a piece of machinery comes and crushes your foot or, your, or that unfortunate child who gets their arm ripped off in that belt. Uh, I keep coming back to this unfortunate child in my discussions. Um, and you get your arm ripped off, ripped off in that belt. If you survive... Are you going to have your job back when you, when you get better? No. And how are you going to survive in the meantime between the time of your injury and when you might be able to go back to work? Is there a workman's comp? Is there any sort of social security to, to allow you to survive? No. So the position of the workers was tremendously vulnerable. The power in the relationship rested mostly in the hands of the factory owners, the mill owners, the industrialists themselves. And for their purposes, that was good. Because they had control, they could generate a ton of profit. But the workers do begin to get tired of that situation, tired of the danger, the low pay, the long hours, the entire thing. So what we begin to see in the aftermath of the Civil War, in the period that we can sometimes call Reconstruction, as American industry is, is rebounding and growing at a furious pace, is that workers begin to organize. They begin to unionize. And what emerges is the beginnings of a nationwide unionization movement. There are three significant unions that uh, begin to emerge during this time period that we're talking about that become um, nationwide uh, organize, organizations for laborers. One is the Knights of Labor. That is the oldest na uh, national labor organization in the United States. Uh, that is established in 1869. In 1886, the American Federation of Labor is organized, and we'll talk about each of these in a minute. And in 1905, a group called the International Workers of the World is founded. Uh, their nickname was the Wobblies. Um, we'll get to them in a little bit. What we begin to see during this period of the Second Industrial Revolution is that the workers do begin to attempt to organize. They do begin to attempt to unionize. They do begin to att attempt collective action to improve their situation, to improve their position in relationship to the corporations, uh, to get a bigger piece of the, of the profit pie, if you will, from uh, this growing and booming American economy. So let's uh, jump into these labor movement, these labor organizations. The first one is the Knights of Labor. The Knights of Labor were founded by a guy named U Uriah Stevens. Um, in 1869, Uriah Stevens eventually loses control of the organization, however, and um, he's replaced by that man over there with the great mustache. His name is Terence Powderly. Uh, what the Knights of Labor were, were a, an organization of unskilled laborers from across the United States in different industries. This becomes kind of the umbrella union for uh, those workers. And it functions as sort of a secret society. It was an underground organization. It was not, uh, it, it was not um, allowed to exist by the government or by the corporations themselves. This was workers secretly organizing, keeping their membership secret uh, as a means of trying to solidify their base, become a, a collective voice for the improvement of their working conditions. Among the things that the Knights of Labor pushed for were things like an eight-hour workday, equal pay for equal work, uh, better wages in general, and the abolition of child labor. Now, why would they want to get rid of child labor? Yeah, it had nothing to do with the safety of the children. The children were taking jobs that could go to adults. So it was for the benefit of their members to, per, to cut out an, an aspect of competition. We 
put the children back in school. There are now jobs that can be filled by dues paying adult members of the union. They looked for uh, se- uh, health and safety laws and called for the arbitration of labor disputes. So a lot of the things that unions are still doing today, we saw the Knights of Labor doing that. Uh, it grows relatively quickly. In fact, by 1886, there's about 700,000 members of the Knights of Labor across the United States in a wide variety of industries. However, um, its success is fleeting. It doesn't last for very long because after 1886, uh, a series of failed strikes and um, violence that's associated with the Knights of Labor does lead to a rapid decline in membership and the eventual uh, dissolving of the Knights of Labor. the organization itself does become associated with acts of industrial violence. Uh, some of the protests, some of the the labor actions that the, the Knights of Labor sponsor do become bloody, for lack of a better term. And in fact, this cartoon over here at the top kind of uh, satirizes that situation. What we see there is Terence Powderly, the president of the Knights of Labor. Uh, it plays on his last name also, Powderly, uh, sitting on what? a powder keg. And what is he holding in his hands but burning embers? Now, what happens if you have embers and you have gunpowder? Boom. So there was this association of of, uh, disorder with the Knights of Labor that does hurt its reputation. It does have a lack of success in many of its uh, attempted labor movements. So that does eventually bring down the popularity of the union and uh, compromise its membership. The other, the next major union to emerge was the American Federation of Labor, which was founded by that guy. Anybody know who that is? Samuel Gompers. Uh, If you remember your high school history classes, you might remember the name Samuel Gompers. Even if you don't remember anything else, it was an unusual name. So he, uh, forms the, the um, American Federation of Labor, the, the AFL, uh, in 1881 and leads that organization for, for several decades. The AFL was different than the Knights of Labor, whereas the Knights of Labor was a nationwide umbrella organization that included skilled and unskilled workers. The AFL only consisted of skilled workers. Now, what's the difference between a skilled and an unskilled worker? Training. Training. A skilled worker is something like a carpenter or a plumber or a blacksmith, somebody that has to have an apprenticeship, some sort of formal training before they can enter into that profession. An unskilled worker is somebody who is folding cardboard boxes, let's say, something like that. So there was a distinction between skilled labor and unskilled labor. The AFL starts off as an umbrella organization protecting skilled laborers. Now, that sounds great, but that left out about 90% of the American working uh, uh, labor force. That's the word I'm looking for, labor force. Most laborers in the United States were unskilled laborers. There were very few that had the training, that had had the apprenticeship that were in those skilled trades. So it did weaken the AFL because a lot of people were left out of the organization, at least at first. The AFL advocated the use of things like strikes and boycotts uh, as a means of... um, forcing the hand of the, the um, of the organizations of the the industry it advocated collective bargaining as a tool for all the members of the union and by um, 1900 or so it had about half a million members across the United States so it does become a sizable uh, union organization representing different, Uh, jobs across the country, but again, skilled laborers who were represented by the AFL. Now, one of the things that the AFL was against had to do with immigration. Um, During this time period, this second industrial revolution, the last decades of the 19th and early decades of the 20th century, we see a peak in immigration to the United States, particularly from Southern and Eastern Europe. We have a lot of Italians, a lot of Poles, a lot of uh, Russian Jewish refugees arriving in the United States. Um, The story of immigration in the United States is a complex story. Uh, We don't often 
welcome immigrants with open arms. Uh, but during this period, many of these immigrants were arriving in this country and were finding jobs in American factories, in American mills, in a wide variety of industries across the country. Some people were working in the, the coal mines, some people were laying railroad tracks, people were working in the steel mills, in all these different places. Organizations like the AFL tended to be anti-immigrant because they saw immigrants as competition for their union members, for, for the uh, native-born laborers in the United States. And in fact, what we see here on this cartoon are a number of anti-immigrant uh, images that were popularized, that were published during this time. This one over here shows the immigrant laborer, unskilled laborer, coming off the boat, and it says, imported duty-free by trust monopoly and company to compete with American labor. It's pretty straightforward. That one over there uh, calls for the building of a wall of immigration restriction to prevent these unskilled laborers who happen to be from different parts of Europe uh, from coming into the United States. And that last one kind of preyed on a fear that many Americans had, that these Immigrants are going to come here and they're going to take our jobs and take the food off of the table of hardworking Americans. Uh, rhetoric that's still sadly familiar in American politics. And what we see in that image is a rather ratty looking figure. The feather on his hat says pauper labor, stealing the bread and butter from the table of a hardworking American. So immigration complicates the story of uh, the rise of unions in the United States because there was, even among the unions, a strong anti-immigrant sentiment. So um, it really is a dynamic period in the history of the country in terms of change that is occurring. We have these monopolies that are rising, that have tremendous power, tremendous wealth. The United States is industrializing. We become the largest economy in the world, yet we have this laboring class that is struggling for what they see as fairness, for equal pay, or for better pay, for safer working conditions, for shorter working days. And then we throw in these immigrants that are maybe or maybe not taking American jobs from those hardworking Americans. So there was all sorts of complications that were, that were emerging during this time period. Yet the struggle between workers and industrialists does continue. And in the early 20th century, um, one of the more entertaining of our labor unions does emerge. Uh, a group called the IWW, the International Workers of the World, was founded by a man named Bill, a uh, big Bill Haywood, who we see over there. Now the IWW was unlike the AFL, unlike the Knights of Labor, in several regards. This tended to be the union that um, rough and tumble occupations went to. Uh, lumberjacks, stevedores, dockyard workers were all members of the IWW. And the IWW advocated uh, militant action in labor disputes. Now, what did that mean? That meant that if you were a, um, a lumberjack and you were having trouble with the mill that was paying you to cut down trees, what would you do? You'd go and sabotage the mill. You'd break the teeth off of the giant saw that cut the, the trees into boards. You would blockade the door. Uh, you would dump piles of, of cut lumber in front of the factory door so that nobody could get in or out. It advocated violence in some cases, fighting, physically fighting with the, um, the mill ownership. So the IWW tended to be the most radical of these labor unions, and it was one that was open to immigrants. Uh, a lot of those dangerous jobs, immigrants went to those occupations. The IWW didn't really care about where you were from as long as you, they, you had the manpower, you, they could use your manpower in these uh, legal, in these labor disputes, excuse me. The IWW was never very large in its membership. It never exceeded 100,000 members across, across the nation. But they were one of those uh, more forceful and more... Um, attention grabbing of the labor organizations because of their tactics, because of their, uh, the colorfulness of their founder and of their membership itself. Uh, this Wobbly's um, poster right there at the top, IWW, Industrial Workers of the World, could also be I Will Win. You have that burly guy standing there in the middle, very determined to look uh, to win in his labor dispute. So you have these nationwide unions that begin to emerge, that begin to organize, that begin to have some impact on the relationship between the workers and the industrialists and the factory workers. Despite this, however, the balance of power still rested firmly 
with the monopolists, with the corporations. Uh, we see that here in this cartoon. This is called the uh, Tournament of Today, depicting the struggles of the working class. And what do we see here? This is from 1883. But you have the laborer over there on his broken down donkey, armed with a mallet, wearing a paper hat, facing off against the power of the monopolies over here. The gilded horse, the knight with the big uh, lance on it. And if you look, what is the horse actually covering up? A locomotive. The railroad industry right there. In the balcony behind there, you have the, um, the capitalists, the moneyed interests, looking at this struggle as it plays out. In the grandstands over there to the right, you have the working classes. Does this look like a fair fight? Does this look like an equal battle? Certainly not. Power, money, uh, political power was on the side of the corporations at this time. Yet the workers do begin to organize, they do begin to protest, they do begin to, to advocate and push for change. Uh, one of the first great nationwide or far-reaching labor movements, uh, labor actions of the time period occurs in 1877 with the Great Railroad Strike. The Great Railroad Strike begins when... Um, the B and O Railroad. Now, if any of you ever played Monopoly, the B and O Railroad is one of those railroads you can buy there. Um, maybe after you hear this, you'll feel differently about buying the railroads on a Monopoly board. In any case, the B and O Railroad wanted to cut across the board the pay of workers by 10%. We're just not going to pay you anymore. We're going to cut your pay by 10%. Um, of course, the workers had very little recourse to, to prevent this. So what happens? The, the workers at the B&O Railroad decide to go on strike. They are supported by workers on other railroad co companies across the United States, across the eastern United States. Essentially, the railroad workers say, we're not going to work for reduced pay. They are joined by those other railroad workers. And what happens to the rail industry in the United States? It shuts down. It comes to a virtual standstill. Now, the industrialists, the factory owners and the railroad managers were not really happy with this, so they call in um, National Guards and private detectives, and you end up having violence and fighting and property damage. Ultimately, what occurs is that um, the strikers destroy some $5 million worth of railroad property in the midst of this strike. And we see some of the aftermath of that over here in that upper image. And in response, the railroad companies call in those federal troops to break the strikes. So you have federal troops coming in and forcing the workers to, to give up the strike and eventually forcing the workers to go back to work at that decreased pay. The railroad strike is one of the first examples of a broad-based nationwide um, labor movement, labor action, but it fails miserably. And it fails because the corporations have the backing of the states. So the laborers don't succeed in this instance. Um, that story will continue as we look at the other labor actions. Um, in 1892, for example, there is the famous homestead strike that occurs just outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, the homestead mill was a steel mill that was owned by the Carnegie Steel Corporation. Andrew Carnegie, one of the richest men in the world, one of the richest men in history. Uh, and what we see is that the the Carnegie Steel Corporation attempted to cut the pay of union members. Now, one of the reasons why most of these unions were at first secret societies, underground groups, was because union members feared that they would be uh, repressed, that there would be uh, repercussions if the corporate bosses knew that they were members of a union. Well, here, the Carnegie Mill says, we're, we are going to cut the pay of the union members at our mill. And of course, what do the union members do? They are unhappy with that. They go out on strike. The, the union itself was the Amalgamated Association of Iron and Steel Workers, which was an affiliate of the AFL. So we see this labor union uh, going out on strike, leaving their jobs um, and going out to protest the working, uh, the proposed pay cut. By doing that, the mill is virtually shut down. So what does the Carnegie Corporation try to do? Well, they hire Pinkerton detectives up in Pittsburgh, and they sail them down the river to go and try to break the strike to force their way into the mill to start the mill operating. And what that leads to is essentially a pitched battle between the striking iron workers and the Pinkerton detectives. Um, we see images of that over here. 
Basically, the Pinkertons are coming across the river on boats, and the striking workers, uh, who have made some makeshift uh, barricades out of the iron that they had, uh, begin to shoot at the Pinkertons, forcing the Pinkertons to turn around and flee. The workers have control of the mill. That continues uh, for several weeks until the plant manager, a guy named uh, Henry Frick. Does anybody know Henry Frick? Ever been to the Frick Collection in New York City? That was his house and his art collection. He becomes one of these, these robber barons, one of these uh, tremendously powerful uh, individuals. Well, he appeals to the state governor uh, of Pennsylvania for help in breaking the strike. The governor sends 8,000 National Guard troops to restore order. We see that happening down there in that lower image. And essentially what occurs is that when the, the National Guard troops show up, they... Uh, break the strike, and those workers who had gone on strike are forced to go back to work at the reduced rate of pay. Uh, this strike was actually so costly for the amalgamated steel workers that um, it undermines the strength of steel strikes and the steel unions for several decades. So it really does leave a long legacy. It really does leave a scar on the steel workers' union as a result of the failure of the homestead strike. A short time later, another strike has nationwide implications, the Pullman strike. Now, what was the Pullman strike all about? What was the Pullman company all about? What did they make? Railroad cars. The Pullman Palace Car Company made the best, most famous, most luxurious railroad cars uh, in the world at that time. They were their Pullman cars were virtually on every train across the United States. Well, what happens here? In uh, 1894, the Pullman company proposes 25% pay cuts for their workers. Um, at the same time that that was happening, the Pullman company was raising the rents on workers who lived in factory, factory housing. So we're cutting your pay, but we're raising your rent. That sounds like a great deal, doesn't it? So the Pullman workers go out on strike to protest this. They were being squeezed between those, those grindstones. The Pullman workers are supported by the uh, American Railway Union and their leader, their president, Eugene V. Debs. Debs throws his support behind the Pullman workers. He takes his union out on strike to support the Pullman workers. Now, what did that mean? Well, the American Railway workers said, we are not going to work on any trains that have Pullman cars. Well... That was virtually every train in the United States. So what we see is that the Pullman strike, uh, these workers at the Pullman factory have support from a different railway union. The, the members of the railway union go out on strike and it shuts down rail traffic across the country. Trains were not running. There was a virtual standstill of all rail traffic west of Chicago. There were no trains running. So this becomes hugely problematic for uh, the Pullman Company, for the railroad corporations. Eventually, what happens, uh, the railroad corporations, not the Pullman Corporation, but the railroad corporations, appeal to the federal government for help. They turn to the president, Grover Cleveland, to do something about the strike because the strike is messing up rail traffic in the United States. So what does Grover Cleveland do? He sends the military out to operate the trains. Uh, so the train traffic begins to pick up west of Chicago because you have the Marines and the Army driving the trains in place of the railway workers. Now, how did Cleveland justify this decision? He said he was protecting the mails. He was protecting the U.S. postal delivery. One of the duties of the president is to ensure that the mail gets delivered. It's in the Constitution somewhere. Um, so in order to make sure that mail was getting delivered, mail that was carried on the trains... Cleveland was able to justify sending the troops to run the railroads uh, across the United States. That virtually um, destroys any power that the railway union had uh, in supporting the Pullman workers. There's actually a federal injunction that's issued um, that forbid the unions from going on strike, the railway workers from going on strike. Now, Eugene V. Debs, the head of that union, uh, attempted to defy that injunction. He said, no, we're still going to go out on strike, even though most of his workers had gone back to work. And he himself is uh, arrested and imprisoned for defying a federal injunction. Well, once the railway workers... Um, kind of abandoned their strike, the Pullman workers were at a loss. They no longer had that broad-based support, and their strike eventually falls apart, and they are forced to go back to work, 
at the reduced salary. So again, the corporations seem to be winning, the powers that be seem to be winning, and it's largely because they have the backing of the states, the backing of the federal government. Here we see some scenes from the, uh, the Pullman strike here on the screen. Now, at roughly the same time that the Pullman strike is failing, um, unions are still growing in membership. There is a growing uh, concern among the working classes about the injustice of the economic system as it's developing. And in May of 1886, um, a gathering is held at a place called Haymarket Square in Chicago. What we see at Haymarket Square is that numerous speakers are going and giving speeches about the the labor situation, the unfairness of the politics, all that sort of stuff that you would hear at a, a, a rally of this sort. And for most of the day, it's a relatively peaceful event. Now, there are undercover police officers there kind of keeping an eye on them. There was a profound fear in the United States and really in Europe also that anarchists were going to uh, show up and start um, causing destruction, trying to overthrow governments. So the, the idea of anarchists was very much um, in the forefront of people's minds. But you have this Haymarket rally that is taking place there on May 4th, 1886. Now, the date itself is important. Why May 4th? Well, internationally, what's the International Workers' Day? May 1st. May 1st is celebrated as International Workers' Day around the world, every place but in the United States where we celebrate Labor Day at the beginning of September, and that's on purpose. Um, and I'll explain that later on. So this rally was held close to the date of May 1st at International Workers Day, and you have speakers, and you have union members, and you have all these representatives there. Toward the end of the day, however, uh, police, the police in Chicago descend on the square trying to clear it out, trying to, to uh, force the people out, and uh, somebody throws a bomb at the police. And you have this explosion and you have lots of police officers that are wounded and lots of police officers that are killed. And it essentially descends into a melee, into a, a riot as people are trying to flee the square and the police are coming in in more numbers and you have the violence, you have the, the loss of life and the death that's occurring there. Uh, we see that dramatically illustrated in both of these scenes on the screen. So um, the Haymarket riot, as it comes to be known, really does give labor and the labor movement a black eye at this time. One of the groups that suffers most significantly from this is the Knights of Labor, because they were one of the organizing groups of this rally in Chicago. When the uh, bomb goes off, when you have this bloodshed and you have this violence, they, that is tied to the Knights of Labor, and suddenly uh, people begin to question their legality, question their existence, and the Knights of Labor does shortly thereafter fold as a labor union. So. You have uh, the Haymarket riot, which is kind of this uh, dividing point in our story, if you will. One of the people who was attending the Haymarket riot, who had given a speech that day, was a labor leader and social activist named Mary Harris Jones, who comes to be called Mother Jones. Uh, she is kind of matronly looking over here. Um, at one point in her career, she becomes known as the most dangerous woman in America. She was a vocal advocate and organizer against child labor. She supported the idea of workers' rights and helped shape the spirit of civil disobedience that would shape later uh, public protests across the United States. We think of civil disobedience, we think sometimes of the early civil rights movement and sit-ins and at lunch counters in, in uh, North Carolina. That idea was put forward by um, Mother Jones in her writings, in her support of the labor movement during this time period. She did. She was a supporter of the Knights of Labor, and she was also a, a vocal advocate for the United Mine Workers uh, of the United States. In 1903, she actually leads a uh, child strike, if you will, leading child workers out on strike, protesting the practice of child labor. So she becomes a, uh, a symbolically important figure in the labor movement at the end of the 19th and the early 20th century, um, and, and an advocate for social change and industrial change. Um, despite that, despite the violence at, at Haymarket Square, despite the the growing kind of somewhat sympathetic view of the labor movement in parts of the United States. Uh, industry, the corporations really did not want to deal with their workers, did not want to give the workers much uh, weight in, in their discussions. So we do continue, continue to see labor strife across the country. Um, miners in particular were, per, were very, very vocal 
in pushing for changing working conditions. Again, mining is a dangerous occupation. It is a deadly occupation. There are countless uh, examples of people being killed or maimed in mining accidents. So the miners were very much aware of the dangers of what they did. They were very much aware that they needed some security for their families, for their, for their own lives. And we do see um, numerous, numerous minor strikes throughout the United States at the end of the 19th and early 20th century. Two of the important ones were the ones that occurred at Coeur d'Alene, Idaho in 1892 and Cripple Creek, Colorado in uh, 1894. The strike at Coeur d'Alene over here in Idaho, which was a location where there was lead and silver that was mined, um, occurs... Uh, when the workers go out on strike for better working conditions, safer working conditions, and higher salaries. The workers go out on strike, but what, do the mine, what does the mine company do? They hire replacement workers. They hire what we call scabs to come in and work the mines. Well, the striking workers are unhappy about that, so they begin to attack the replacement workers. And you have this bloodshed and this fighting that occurs in the streets. Eventually, uh, the state militia and federal troops are sent in to restore order and to suppress the strike. And those striking workers at Coeur d'Alene essentially lose out. They are forced back to work without any improvement in their conditions. Two years later at Cripple Creek, a similar situation begins to unfold. The strikers go out on, on strike. Here there's gold fields, so gold was what was mined there. They go out on strike looking for better working conditions, looking for better uh, pay. The mine owners bring in replacement miners, replacement uh, strike breakers, essentially, to go and work in the mines. The miners, the striking miners, attack the replacement miners. And you have, again, bloodshed. You have fighting that occurs between the two camps. Once again, um, the company owners try to use force to break the strike. This time they hire a private militia to come in and fight against the striking workers. The state, however, sends in the state militia to ensure peace in the area. And the state militia ends up siding with the striking workers fighting against the private militia. And ultimately what happens? The, strike, the strikers win. They are able to uh, achieve their goals because they had the backing of the state militia. They had the backing of state power. Now, why does the state militia end up siding with the striking workers here at, at Cripple Creek rather than fighting against them? Well, part of it might be that the company had brought in a private militia so you had kind of a mercenary force there. And part of it might have been because the militia members might have been sympathetic to what these strikers were going through. Who was making up the state militia? But probably people like those miners. So there might have been that kind of sympathy that was, uh, that was there that played a role in the outcome of that, of that strike. Um, in any case, what we see... During the Gilded Age, that period from the end of the Civil War to about 1900, 1910, was that labor strife does break out across the United States. We see strikes in every state of the Union except Nevada. Uh, for some reason, there's no, no labor strife in Nevada. It could be because there were about six people that lived in Nevada at that time. But everywhere on the map that you see in pink was a place where there was labor strife of some sort that, that broke out, some sort of labor movement and fighting between the corporations, the industrialists, and the workers. So we see this um, spreading desire for workers across the United States to have more equitable conditions, better pay, safer working conditions, shorter working weeks. Um, so that's really the situation that we see going on there. Now we can take a look at two views of the social and political situation in the United States at that time. Two cartoons that are pretty similar in how they are depicted. Um, this one here is called The New Slavery and the New Slave Holders. And what you have in this one is the figure of the labor agitator here with the top hat holding the whip, forcing the laborers to... Um, to essentially vote his way. You're a member of the union, you will vote as the union tells you to vote. We voted, okay, we're done, uh, <laughs> class dismissed. Uh, <laughs> the cartoon on the right has kind of a similar point of view, but it shows the industrialist, the factory owner, controlling the workers and controlling their vote. If you wanna work here, you have to vote the way I want you to vote. So we see that 
uh, both parties here are accusing the other of controlling the people and that the the members or the workers aren't really thinking for themselves and in their best interest. They are be doing what they are told to do, uh, whether it is the union boss telling them that or the industrialist that that's telling them that. Uh, this does kind of disregard the, um, the individual desires of the people themselves. But it is... Uh, an aspect of the story as it was presented to the public at that time. Now, by the time we get into the 20th century, um, the labor movement is growing. Unions are beginning to have some success in protesting against working conditions and low pay. Uh, working hours are starting to be cut down. There is a thought of reducing the amount of child labor, although that would eventually take uh, state and federal legislation to roll that back. Uh, which Arkansas is working hard to undo um, currently. But um, we do still see important reasons why the labor movement was needed in the 20th century. One of those was a tragedy that occurred in New York City in 1911, the infamous Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. Now, what happened at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory? You had a uh, large group of women who were working in this factory that made shirtwaist. What's a shirtwaist? It is a, a, a woman's blouse, essentially. That was the name, for, name of it at that time. So it was a factory where these items of clothing were made. They were manufactured. This is in, um, uh, actually in Washington Square uh, in lower Manhattan, right near where NYU is today. Um, and the owners of the factory did not trust their workers. They didn't want the workers to steal material to bring home with them. They did not want the workers taking unnecessary breaks. So when the women came to work, all of the doors were locked. Well, what happens at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory? But a fire breaks out and it rapidly spreads across the factory floor. This is the upper story of a, uh, I believe like an eight story of a building in Manhattan. You can see the building over there on the, the lower image. Uh, and the fire spreads rapidly going from the cotton cloth to the machinery, to the oil that's on the floor. And it traps the workers inside. They can't escape because the doors are locked. They can't get out of the flames. Ultimately, what happens at the Triangle Shirtwaist uh, tragedy is that 146 workers are killed by the outbreak of this fire. Many of them killed in the fire, and we see the aftermath in that upper image, many of them jumping from the, the windows to uh, not be burned to death. So there are tremendously tragic scenes of um, bodies laying along the sidewalk there right at the foot of that building. Now, what's somewhat tragically ironic about this is that uh, two years earlier in 1909, in upstate New York, there had been a successful labor protest by women working in the, t in the shirtwaist industry. It's a, an uprising that was, uh, excuse me, a strike that was called the Uprising of the 20,000. And it was a labor strike by these workers in a shirtwaist factory in upstate New York who were mostly immigrants to the United States. They went out on strike protesting the bad working conditions that they, they had to struggle through and the low pay that they dealt with. And um, because they were women, and because they were joined by their family and their children, they ended up garnering public sympathy and ultimately were successful in improving the working conditions for themselves in the factories in upstate New York. Sadly, those improvements didn't make their way to New York City, uh, which probably could have prevented the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory uh, fire. So we have this, this incident in New York in 1911. Of course, that caused concern among other textile workers around the United States. And it did lead to further uh, labor actions. One of the places where that occurred was close to home here in Massachusetts, in Lawrence, uh, in early 1912. You have what is called the Bread and Roses Strike. Uh, the Bread and Roses Strike consisted of uh, workers, again, mostly women, in these textile mills in Lawrence, um, walking away from their, their jobs, going out on strike to protest for better working conditions, safer working conditions. They didn't want to end up like what had happened in New York City at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. So they go out to protest the, the uh, working conditions. And when they go out of the factories, they take their families with them, they take their children with them as they are protesting. Well, what happens? The mill owners um, decide that 
the women needed to get back to work and that they didn't didn't have the right to go out on strike. And they asked the local police to break the strike. So the police in Lawrence descend on these striking workers and begin to uh, brutally beat them with billy clubs and horses and things like that to force the workers to go back. Of course, these events are now being captured by photographers. And the images of the brutality toward the striking women workers who were there on the protest lines with their children in their arms, being beaten by the police, um, are splashed across the newspapers around the country. And that causes a public outcry against the police in Lawrence and against the factory owners. Um, so uh, that public sympathy lends weight to the demands that the striking workers in Lawrence had and actually leads to the um, resolution of this strike in the workers' favor. When they do finally go back to work, they do so with a shortened work week. It's cut down to a 54-hour work week and a 15% pay increase. So they managed to achieve their goals, but many people did suffer because of the um, the violence of the police toward breaking the strike. One of the key figures in the Bread and Roses strike is this woman, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. Anybody heard of her? She was a fiery vocal advocate for workers' rights in the United States. She was one of the organizers of the, uh, the Bread and Roses strike uh, and a founder of the American Civil Liberties Union. She eventually uh, becomes a member of the American Communist Party and... Um, moves to Russia and dies in the Soviet Union. Uh, but she is an early advocate of labor rights in the 20th century and one of the organizers of that protest. Now, because of these events, because of the Triangle Shirtwaist tragedy, because of the uh, uprising of the 20,000 and the Bread and Roses strike, the federal government does finally begin to take labor rights seriously. And what we see occurring in 1913 is the creation of the Department of Labor. Now, the Department of Labor is signed into existence by President William Howard Taft on his last day in office. Uh, he was about to um, leave office. He was going to be succeeded by Woodrow Wilson. But one of the last things that Taft does is he signs this bit of legislation creating the Labor Department. He does so uh, begrudgingly. He was not necessarily a supporter of labor movements. But he does this, and the uh, appointment of the first Secretary of Labor, who we see here, William Wilson, uh, falls into the lap of Woodrow Wilson. Uh, not related, by the way. So he becomes the first Secretary of Labor. What was the job of the Labor Department? But to kind of um, regulate and moderate and um, perhaps negotiate between the laborers and the industrialists, it was starting to balance that playing, that playing field a little bit for the unions, for the, the working classes. Despite that, despite the creation of the Department of Labor, the turmoil between the workers and the industrialists still went on. And we do still have dramatic action uh, of uh, dramatic actions of labor strife and violence that do occur. One of the most um, chaotic and one of the most uh, noted is an event that occurs in Colorado uh, that comes to be called the Ludlow Massacre. Now, this was part of a protracted labor dispute between miners and mining companies uh, that comes to be called the Colorado Coalfield War, uh, which lasts from about 1913 to 1914. What we see here at the Ludlow Massacre is that many of the striking workers had set up a tent city at this place called Ludlow. We can see the workers here with their families in the tent city behind them. And they were um, protesting their working conditions, looking for better working conditions, that sort of thing. Uh, the mine companies hired uh, strike breakers, hired scab workers to go and extract the coal, which of course doesn't sit well with the, the striking miners. And you have fights breaking out between the miners on strike and the, the scab miners who are working. And this violence begins to escalate and it begins to, to become much more complex. Ultimately, uh, as the violence begins to spread throughout the Ludlow camp and the violence between the, the two striking, fa the, the two mining factions develops, what happens? The Colorado National Guard is sent in to maintain order. And when the Colorado National Guard goes in, what do they do? They destroy the Ludlow camp. They um, set it on fire. They kill about 21 of the inhabitants of that camp, including children. And um, it becomes an even bigger bloodbath. The miners retaliate by attacking 
the National Guard troops, and you have this all-out battle that ensues there in Ludlow. It doesn't come to an end until late April, when federal troops are finally sent in to restore law and order in Colorado and put an end to this coal field war. So the labor situation uh, was still tenuous. It was still destructive. It was still disruptive in many parts of the United States. Now, 1919 happened to be a year of tremendous labor struggle in the United States with uh, strikes breaking out across the country. Uh, 1919 is significant because it is the year after the First World War ends. And during the war, the federal government had imposed strict regulations concerning labor relations and, and um, the production of goods. The government had regulated pretty much everything. Once those controls were removed, however, the parties, the laborers, the, workings, the working man, and the factories, the industrialists, uh, essentially go back to their old ways and are fighting for power, fighting for control, fighting for over working conditions. And that does lead to these nationwide strikes. Three of the most celebrated include the Seattle General Strike, which occurs in February of 1919. The Seattle strike was a general strike, meaning all the laborers in, Chicago, in uh, Seattle basically go out on strike for five days. They all agree that they're not going to work. Um, more than 65,000 workers go out on strike in February of um, 1919, essentially shutting down the city of Seattle. That's depicted up here in that top image. Uh, the dissatisfied workers begin to um, push for higher wages, wages that they had been making during the war. Once those government controls were removed, their wages plummeted, so they wanted the higher wages back. So they go out on this, on this strike to look for those increased wages. Uh, other unions, many other groups do eventually join this general strike in Chicago. And as I said, it does paralyze the city. You also have the famous Boston police strike. When the police department in Boston decides to go out on strike for higher pay and better working conditions, uh, about 80% of the Boston police force refuses to report for work in September of 1919. Um, and for several days, Oh, can you imagine Boston without a police force? Uh, chaos does begin to reign. At first, not much changes in the city, but as soon as people began to realize that, hey, the police are out on strike and we can get away with things, people tried to get away with things. So um, what happens in the Boston police strike? The governor of Massachusetts, one Calvin Coolidge, sends in the National Guard to uh, to take over the police activities. And essentially what occurs is that the Boston police strike is broken by the action of the National Guard and the governor. Ultimately, what comes of this is the, um, the idea that things like police departments and fire departments are not legally able to go out on strike because their jobs are too valuable for the public good. So it does kind of uh, limit the, the ability of those types of unions to, to take uh, far-reaching labor action. And then finally, you have the Great Steel Strike, which stretches from September of 1919 to January of 1920. This strike was huge and eventually involved more than 350,000 steel workers across the United States who were demanding higher wages and eight-hour working day, recognition of the unions. Um, it proved to be a tremendous failure because all of these workers go out on strike, but um, because many of the strikers were recent immigrants to the United States, they failed to gain broad public support. Most American, nativist Americans said, oh, we don't really care what's happening to those immigrant workers. So there's not a lot of concern. There's not a lot of, um, of uh, caring about these workers. To make it worse, the factory owners, the mill owners, begin to portray the workers as dangerous radicals who are undermining the American way of life. Um, so the steel strike does end up falling apart. Um, the mill owners say that these immigrants must be communists. They are going to destroy American, American democracy. So the American people broadly did not support the steel strike, and it does end as a dismal failure. Yet after this point, um, the federal government does start to become more involved in legislating 
and regulating the interactions between the corporations and the laborers. Uh, lab labor unions are eventually given legal status in the United States. Uh, to this point, their legal status is somewhat ambiguous. Uh, did labor unions have the right to exist? It had never really clearly been stated. Uh, and what we see is that the labor movement really does begin to grow by the time we get to the 1920s, 1930s, and particularly the mid 20th century. And we can actually see that here on this, um, this graph showing the percentage of workers that belong to labor unions. You can see it kind of peaks here in the aftermath of World War I, then plummets during the Great Depression, then shoots up again during World War II, reaching its, its peak there in the middle of the 20th century. And then from the 1950s and 1960s begins this long, steady decline to about 10% of the population, now probably about 12% uh, today in the beginning of the 21st century. So that, in a nutshell, was really the, the story of the rise and fall and reemergence of the labor movement in the United States and some of the hurdles that were faced in the establishment of these labor unions and the, uh, the movement itself and kind of why it was necessary to have these, these tumultuous moments, to have these organizations to protect the rights of the workers. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Thank you. There. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let me get on my union soapbox for a second. Um, the corporations. The only thing a corporation exists for is for the making of profit. That is why corporations exist. They don't exist to make you comfortable. They don't. Well, if all the if all the profit is going into the hands of three or four people, rather than the people that are actually doing the work, again, that life raft analogy that we saw earlier on, that's not necessarily good. Um, so, um, yes, it may seem, you know, why should a guy putting bolts on a tire on a Ford in a factory in, in Detroit or wherever be making $200,000 a year? Well, it's because that labor is vitally important for the success of the corporation. There is a market for that labor, so you should be paid your market wage, kind of, if we, if we want to go that way uh, in regards to that. Over here. <laughs> Uh, again, the the companies look for profit. Um, when I talk about like industrialization to my my U.S. history classes, I always tr have to remind my students that the corporations don't really care about you other than the fact that you buy their product. You know, they are looking they are looking out for their investors, for their shareholders. Eventually. Um, but, the, you know, the companies can't succeed if their workers, you know, Henry Ford was a lot of things, problematic in many ways, but an innovator in many ways. And he famously says, I don't want any employee at my factory who can't afford to buy the products we make. Now, that justified the pricing of his, his Model Ts, but it also allowed him to kind of justify the salaries he paid the workers in his factories. Yes. Um, labor dues are essentially the, the, like when you join any sort of club, when you join any sort of organization, you pay a fee for the benefits of that organization. And the way that labor dues work is basically each worker, each member of the, the union pays a small amount and it goes into a collective pot that is used to help the organization run, to help to, to defray uh, certain costs when labor action is taken. Uh, it is basically how the, the union functions. If you want a kind of a, a, a coarse analogy, governments collect taxes. That's how governments function. Unions collect union dues. That's how they function. So it's kind of, it's kind of that situation. <laughs>
uh, probably right at the very beginning when the unions themselves were formed. Mm hmm. I think it's tough to always predict the future, but what we have seen in the last decade or so is more uh, interest in the formation of labor unions. You can look at places like Amazon. You can look at companies like Starbucks mm -hmm. and workers at those places are trying to uh, attempt unionization. Now, why are they trying to attempt unionization? Because you have these corporations that are multi-billion dollar corporations and they're still paying their workers $15 an hour. Um, and there's a giant disconnect between the profitability of the corporation and how much of it is actually going to the people that are doing the daily work in allowing that corporation mm -hmm. to succeed. Plus, many of the corporations are benefiting from the fact that they um, hire workers and, you know, schedule them for 29 hours a week so that they're not full time. They don't have to pay benefits, that sort of thing. So, you know, companies do play those games. And really, one of the securities that workers have is collective action. Um, right now, there are several high profile strikes in the United States. There's the United Auto Workers strike, and there's the Screen Actors Guild strike. Now, can't, can you really draw a comparison between guys mm -hmm. building cars and people acting on a movie, a movie screen? Uh, no, other than it has to do with the idea of profitability and um, viability of those industries. The, um, the writer's strike that just ended had to do with profit sharing because a lot of the streaming corporations were taking movies, television shows that were written a decade ago, two decades ago before streaming even existed, and they're reshowing them and they're making a profit from the labor of those writers uh, when they created that product. So the changing environment, the changing economics of uh, American society will call for a renegotiation, I guess we could call it, of the relationship between workers and companies. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, AI, AI is complicating things even further, artificial intelligence, because now you can go and tell your computer, hey, uh, write me a script about, you know, three friends meeting in a coffee shop and it'll kick something out. Um, and that is further threatening the success of writers and artists and other groups. Yes. Uh, what were the names of the, 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 the women that started it? I, you're, you're putting me on the spot now. <laughs> uh, I don't remember offhand. <laughs> yeah. Shoes. Yep. Okay. Right. And, and certainly we see that in, not to that extreme in, in the United States, we see the government playing a role in trying to be the mediator at times between the demands of labor and the, the demands of, of industry. Um, we can look at examples like during the Second World War. 
the government establishes various offices to make sure that there were no labor disputes to keep factories going, to keep armaments being produced and that sort of thing. And it was a, an artificial creation of the federal government to ensure the production of war material. Um, the government does have a tremendous amount of, of sway in kind of structuring the relationship. Federal legislation can throw support behind the unions and give unions more weight. Of course, that was what was occurring during the middle of the 20th century. We get to the 1980s and, and uh, Ronald Reagan's presidency, and a lot of the securities, a lot of the kind of uh, legislation that protected labor unions begins to erode. We can see how uh, what happened with the air control workers strike, air traffic controllers strike in, was that 1981, 1982? Uh, they go out on strike, and what does Reagan do? He fires them. Um, and, you know, there was no recourse that they had because you had to have the air traffic controllers because of air, the amount of air travel. So the government can play a vital role in maintaining the balance and in, um, in kind of leveling that playing field, but there has to be the will to do so on behalf of the government. And that, of course, varies depending on who's in charge and who's, who's got the votes. So um, last one. <sighs> if they did, it was not as blatant as it is today. Can we, can we put it that way? Uh, money in politics have always been um, dangerous bedfellows. Um, the Supreme Court, for much of its history, has seemed to be above the fray. What has occurred in the last couple of decades, really since like the late 1980s, early 1990s, is that the American, American politics have become more polarized, more factionalized, if you will. And uh, in many cases, the Supreme Court is a, uh, a prize to be gained to push forward political agendas that aren't necessarily beneficial for the American people or stuff. So, um, there may have been corruption at times. In fact, there was one Supreme Court justice who was um, impeached uh, many, many years ago in the early 1800s, but he was uh, acquitted. And I think he was impeached because of suspected corruption, but it was never proved. So um, money has always been involved in politics. The Supreme Court for much of its history has kind of been above that, but that seems to have been um, compromised of late. All right, well, thanks a lot for joining me. Um, I think I'm coming back in December, but I could be wrong about the date. So uh, if I come back, I hope to see you all. Otherwise, um, enjoy what was a nice day. Now it looks like it's getting cloudy, but I will see you next time. <laughs>